they were completely devoted to each other. They were a loving couple that were together for quite some time. With not an enemy in the world. Their friends were good people, and I think good people attract good people. Good people who somehow end up dead in the trunk of a car. Who could have done such a terrible thing? The treatment of the victims is shocking. I didn't know anybody could be that brutal to somebody. All the killer leaves behind is a mysterious set of clues. The blood smears indicate that there was violence there. We had these military writings that were all over the place. We were wondering if this is some disgruntled military person. The case is confounding investigators. There were just so many questions, so many unknowns. We had a whodunit. The first 48 hours were over, and we were down for the long haul. To jumpstart the investigation, they turned to a criminal profiler. It was a horrific crime, and we were very anxious to get it solved. She makes some shocking connections. This person seemed to have some kind of fantasy. We didn't know what it was. It seemed to be somewhat sexually sadistic. They fear the killer will strike again. Can they find him in time? We were on a race to stop another homicide. should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Just an hour's drive north of the congestion and crowds, of the city of Toronto is peace and quiet. The quaint town of Caledon is idyllic for city slickers looking for an escape. The large country estates attract the likes of Elton John, who's rumored to have a home in the area. But it's not just for the rich and famous. Being close to Toronto, it just had a great appeal for people to move out there and. A lot of people used it initially as a weekend retreat. It's lovely to be there and to get away from the city. For Toronto residents Susan Osborne and her husband Orville, the solitude of their cottage outside Caledon never loses its appeal. Very dark at night, very quiet. It's very still. There's absolutely no sound when you're out there. The tranquil woodlands have been in the family since 1939, when Susan's father bought the land. When he passed away, the property was divided into two 50-acre parcels, one for Susan and one for her brother, Ian Blackburn. It was very nice having my brother next door, because we were very close friends. With Ian's cottage just down the road from their own, the Osbournes often spent time with Ian, a real estate broker, and his wife, Nancy, a nurse. Ian is lots of fun. He's got a wonderful personality, easy to talk to, lots of friends. And if you would please continue on with the uh, video. He loved to talk. He loved to describe things, and he would act out some of the things. And loved playing Santa Claus. Here we are, all ready for our day in the country. Nancy was the quieter of the two, but just as active. She often volunteered to help the homeless. She had a very big heart, and she had a lot of nurses that were very fond of her. But Nancy's biggest fan was Ian, her husband of nearly 25 years. Never heard a crossword from either of them. I think he was absolutely devoted to her. The couple loved spending time together at their cottage. In early spring, Ian would often come up for the day to get the cottage ready for their visits. It was usually to get it ready for Nancy. Or he was just coming up to have a walk or look around or cut the grass or... Because he loved to come up. He really, really loved Caledon. So on a cool day in early April of 1992, the Osbournes aren't surprised to see Ian's car on his property. But they do wonder why it's not parked in its usual spot beside the cottage. So it seemed rather an odd place to have a car just left plunk in the middle of a driveway. Not even all the way in, just like halfway in the driveway. Orville checks inside the Blackburn's cottage. We each had a key for each other's place. And I walked in and it was 
looked very normal, and I walked into the back room where they would have slept, and there was a, uh, a suit bag, the zipper-type suit bag. Orville figures Ian and Nancy are up from town and out visiting friends. The Osbournes know they'll see them soon enough at their annual maple syrup party in four days. I called them a sugaring off party because that was the finishing of the syrup. When the sap is running, the Osbournes host a gathering of friends and family. Everyone joins in to turn the sap from the maple trees on the property into syrup. We would invite about, oh, there'd be about 40, 50 people come out. They could uh, collect firewood, stoke the fire, and we do the roasty of the marshmallows and the wieners and everything. And we were having a fairly good-sized party. You know, adults, children, dogs, everybody. Only two guests are no-shows, and to Susan's surprise, it's Ian and Nancy. Ian and Nancy were missing from the party, and we were very concerned because they were supposed to be at the party. And I said to Sue, this is very strange. I said, something's really strange here with Ian and Nancy. Now that the party has come and gone, it's clear something is wrong. The couple try reaching the Blackburns at their home in Toronto, but there's no answer. Growing increasingly alarmed, Orville contacts his son Jamie in Toronto. They asked if I could gain entrance to the house here in the city and see if there was uh, any evidence of uh, perhaps something had happened or they had simply forgot to notify us that they were going away on a trip somewhere. So could I go into the house and see if there was any sign of anything going on of that nature. Jamie and his brother-in-law David drive over to the Blackburn's residence. Nancy's car is in the driveway. However, there's no sign of the couple inside. But there is one very hungry cat. So I gave the cat some food and the, and the cat ate the food. And like normally the cat gets looked after quite well and, and uh, the cat goes with them most places. So that sort of seems strange. There's another ominous sign in the couple's bedroom. I saw Nancy's purse was on the bed and was open and, and a few items were out on the bed. That was a bit of an alarm signal for me because she's just not the type of person who A, would leave her purse lying around and B, be without her purse. I kind of went, okay, something is definitely wrong. Jamie and David search every room in the house but find nothing else out of the ordinary. There's just one place left to check. I thought, well, I'll check the car. And I leaned in and I saw a uh, Kleenex sitting on, on the seat. Uh, the dome light was on, so I held it up for uh, David, and I said, is that makeup or blood? Because I, I think it's blood. Then I said, well, there's only one place left that we haven't looked. So I said, well, I got to look in the trunk. Put the key in, turned, lifted the trunk, and I saw the bodies. It's late in Toronto on a cool spring evening. Jamie Osborne and his brother-in-law David make a gruesome discovery. Two bodies stuffed into the trunk of a car. And I looked at David and I said, did you see a coat or a body? And he said, no, I think that was your uncle. And I said, well, do I need to confirm it? And he goes, no, you know what you saw. You kind of go into shock right away. You feel numb and you can't really talk. Shortly after midnight, police detective Doug Grady is on the scene inspecting the grisly find. To see two people in a trunk of a car was totally unusual. You don't see that. I'd never seen that before or since. I could see that the male was closest to the exit of the trunk and the female was in deeper. She was naked. He was dressed uh, fully. It's confirmed. The victims are real estate broker Ian Blackburn and his wife, Nancy. It was pretty awful. We just couldn't believe it. I mean, because these are two people who had, didn't have a, an enemy in the world. It was just, it was, it was horror. Just horrible to think, who could have done such a terrible thing? Grady examines the Blackburns' home to determine if it's the murder scene. When we first went in the house, it looked rather neat and tidy. It was a nice, neat dining room with a salt shaker that was up and had salt around it. It just seemed to be out of character for the neatness of this particular house. Nancy's purse was found in the house, 
but there was no signs that uh, credit cards or anything like that were taken. There may have been an amount of cash, but uh, not much. In the basement, police find cabinets where every shelf is filled with camera equipment, except for one. There was a gap where there was nothing, and that just seemed there should be something there because the place is cluttered with photographic equipment. So that drew our attention to, to what might be missing if anything was missing. But there's nothing to indicate that the couple was killed inside their Toronto home. There was no obvious signs of violence. Things weren't turned over. It was a crime scene because there were likely things missing from the house, but it wasn't a murder scene. Investigators shift their focus to the Blackburn's cottage outside the town of Caledon, where Ian's car was spotted just days before. Because the area is under the jurisdiction of the Ontario Provincial Police, they join the Toronto Police in the investigation. Detective Inspector Jim Hutchinson is assigned to the case. So we were going to the Calden farmhouse to look for a murder scene. It was a very quaint old building that was very clean. When we looked around, there was no obvious signs of a break-in. You know, there was newspapers that was there from December that were, you know, laying beside the fireplace. Like the Toronto home, the cottage doesn't appear to be a murder scene. There was really no signs of any violence. But more typical to see some sort of perhaps blood splattering of some sort, furniture knocked over, some sort of scenes of a struggle and uh, just something to indicate that that's something that happened. Eh? Staff Sergeant Ron Gentle, another detective on the team, finds the pristine cottage just as puzzling. Usually when you have a violent crime scene where two people are murdered especially, you expect a lot of activity. You expect maybe there's going to be a, a sign of somebody cleaning up the crime scene, wiping up blood. Our forensic professionals can look for and find cleaned up crime scenes quite readily. We couldn't find any of that. There's no blood to be found until they reach the stairs. There was smears of blood, both at the top of the stairs leading up into a loft area and at the bottom of the stairs. But whose blood is it? Police send a sample to the Center of Forensic Sciences in Toronto. While they wait for results, detectives piece together the timeline leading up to the couple's murder. I believe it was about a, six days earlier, Ian was last seen at his uh, work. Ian Blackburn left his office that afternoon and, and everybody knew where he was going to, which was up to the, the farm, uh, as he called it, the cottage up in Caledon. Nancy, on the other hand, was a uh, public uh, health nurse. She would check in on schools and we know that she went missing. Somebody called her and she wasn't there. So we know the, the date when they were both last seen. April 7th six days before they're found dead in the trunk of Nancy's car. Police know the couple was murdered sometime during that time period, and now they know something else, whose blood is on the stairs of the cottage. Within a couple of days, the results of the blood came back that it was indeed Nancy Blackburn's uh, blood. Evidence that Nancy met violence and then death at her beloved cottage. But who would have wanted her dead along with her husband? Nothing in the couple's squeaky clean background can explain the tragedy. We looked at family and friends and anywhere that that leads us. So if somebody had us said Nancy was having an affair, we would have gone down that road. But there was nothing like that and nothing like that with Ian either. They were a loving couple that were together for quite some time. Nearly a week into the investigation, it's not looking good to Detective Hutchinson. Usually in the first 48 hours, something will jump out at you. And if it doesn't jump out at you, then you know you're down for the long haul. Police investigating the murder of Ian and Nancy Blackburn think they've found one of the murder scenes, the couple's cottage, where blood was found by the stairs. And it was found to be consistent with being the, the blood of, of Nancy Blackburn. But they have no leads on the killer, no idea who could possibly want this well-loved couple dead. We had a whodunit, the first 48 hours are over, and we were down for the long haul. Family members are just as puzzled. I was totally at a loss, 100% uh, loss. Just couldn't, couldn't put two and two together. How did somebody do this? It just it was a total mystery. Under pressure to solve the case, police decide to bring in Sergeant Kate Lines, 
Trained by the FBI, Lines is the first criminal profiler to ever work for the Ontario Provincial Police. This was one of the first cases that I was actually involved in. It's the criminal profiler's job to analyze all the information relating to the crime scene, the victims, and the evidence, and predict the type of person responsible for the crime. Even though investigators might have forensic evidence, a fingerprint left behind, even DNA, if they don't know who the person is, there's nothing they can move forward with until that person is identified. This looked exactly what I felt that criminal profiling was all about. It's when you have a, a whodunit, but not every cop working the case agrees. I can only say with anything new, you're going to have people who say, you know, it's going to be hocus pocus. It's not going to help you. It is not evidence that can be entered into court. It's not evidence that uh, can convict anybody. This is a chance for Sergeant Lines to prove the value of a criminal profiler. It was a horrific crime, and we were very anxious to get it solved. As Lines gets up to speed, she's struck by the autopsy results. It appears Nancy died of manual strangulation while Ian died of asphyxiation. We'd only have to speculate on the cause of that, but it would be consistent with having a, a plastic bag placed over one's head. To Lines, the different treatment of the victims is significant. We have a male victim, fully clothed, who has suffered some injuries and has evidence of ligatures, that type of thing on the body, but the treatment of the female victim was obviously totally different, not only in the fact that she's disrobed and her body is disposed of with no, no clothes. And Mrs. Blackburn was tied as well as apparently gagged. Mrs. Uh, Blackburn was probably what's described as hog-tied, and that is with her hands and her feet behind her back. To me, these two homicides are primarily about the female victim. Although there was no evidence of sexual assault, Lyons is convinced the crime was sexually motivated. There was no semen found on any swabs or anything of that nature, but it's a bit of a misconception that sexual assault victims are penetrated and that there's always semen left behind, because that's not always the case. To further understand the victims and their unknown killer, Lyons wants to see the cottage in Caledon herself, the location where Nancy Blackburn was likely murdered. This is a beautiful, tranquil community north of Toronto. But things like this just don't happen in that community. So you're, you're wondering, okay, what is it that's occurred to kind of bring this level of violence to this particular residence and to this particular family? Lines is immediately attracted to the unusual octagonal barn on the Blackburn's property. Well, when I go to any scenes, of course, in the early stages of an investigation, you never really know what role a particular building might play. It was pretty much abandoned, but it was a spectacular building, just given uh, its shape and how it presented itself on the farm. It was up on a hill, and it was uh, kind of overlooking the farmhouse. Lines tours the inside of the cottage, taking a different approach from the detectives. I'm not looking for fingerprints. I'm not looking for any evidence. What I'm looking at is the behavior that's been left behind. That it's not necessarily what I'm seeing, but what I'm not seeing. What she doesn't see are signs of a struggle. There was nothing in disarray, very neat and tidy, no you know, furniture broken, no evidence of any kind of upheaval or argument or anything like that within the residence. The tidy scene likely means the killer got Ian quickly under his control and then Nancy, who went to join her husband later that day. Which could speak to possibly that, you know, some kind of weapon is used or there's some kind of threat being used that keeps that victim very controlled. But how did the couple get from the cottage to Toronto, where their bodies were found in the trunk of Nancy's car? When I met with the investigators, one of the questions that I had was if they knew what setting was of the driver's seat. And they got back to me and said that, in fact, the driver's seat was back rather than forward. And this is consistent with Ian Blackburn being the driver of the vehicle rather than Nancy Blackburn because she was shorter in stature. Lines believes Ian was forced to drive the car back to the couple's home in Toronto with Nancy's body likely already in the trunk. But why would the killer wait until Toronto to kill Ian? It looks like the male was, maybe this person doesn't even drive. So he forced Ian to. The injuries sustained 
by Ian Blackburn is quite frankly, he looked like he could have been controlled from the right side of the vehicle given some of the injuries that he sustained. Some type of ligature, like a rope, was tied tightly around Ian's right thigh and right wrist. That could have been where he was actually being caused pain while he was potentially driving. This is what made us come up with the theory is maybe he drove Nancy's car back to Toronto. And then was asphyxiated and placed in the trunk alongside the body of his wife. But why did Nancy drive up to the cottage on her own? On April 7th, the day Ian drove up to Caledon, there were calls from the cottage to the Toronto home, calls Ian likely made under duress. We think what has happened is that Ian was forced to make a phone call to, to Nancy down in Toronto to say for whatever reason he had to stay up at the cottage overnight for her to bring a meal up there so they could share it together. The meal was still in the back seat. She was taken under control very, very quickly as soon as she got there. Line suspects the killer might have already known that Ian had a wife. Having Nancy come to the residence is, how does he know that there's a female? Like, how does he know that, that this person is married? Based on her training, Lines predicts the offender is in the 35 to 45 year old range, younger than the Blackburns who are 49 and 54. People who commit violent crimes usually commit them against people that are relatively the same age as them. But because the offender must have been strong enough to move the two bodies into the trunk. I kind of thought maybe a little bit younger person. Lyne suspects the killer isn't accountable for his time, so likely doesn't work at a regular job or have a significant other. I didn't feel that the person would particularly be married. Again, you're talking about probabilities. Altogether, Lines comes up with 25 predicted characteristics of the unknown killer. This is a really serious case. An entire community was just petrified by what had happened. A well-loved couple, Ian and Nancy Blackburn, were murdered and left in the trunk of their car. There was no reason for it. The victims weren't people that would stick their nose into somebody else's business and cause a problem. The killer left no physical evidence behind at the murder scene. Usually there's something we find, and in this case, uh, there was very, very little. It's the job of criminal profiler Kate Lines to help detectives hone in on a suspect to understand the type of person that would be responsible for the crime. Lines has developed a criminal profile, a list of possible characteristics of the killer. One of his most dangerous traits is a probable obsession with violent sexual fantasies, which Lines concludes from the killer's treatment of victim Nancy Blackburn. She would have suffered greatly by what had occurred and the way that she was tied and the way that she was manipulated and certainly the injuries to her body. The pathologist at the time said it looked like she was thrown around like a suitcase. This person's sexual fantasy seems to be ingrained and also lethal. Um, people are dying here. And more could die now that the offender is acting out his fantasies. The fantasies are often developed in sex offenders' minds with really the only thing missing is to know who it will actually be. Not long after Sergeant Line's profile is distributed to detectives, there's a major find on the Blackburn's cottage property. The first telling evidence left behind by the killer. About 100 meters from the Blackburn farmhouse, there was what we'll call a garbage pile found. In that garbage was found a couple of sections of uh, newspaper, a Toronto newspaper. They're the exact sections missing from a newspaper found inside the Blackburn's cottage. So that brought us to think that whoever dropped that garbage quite likely had been in the cottage. In both of these sections was uh, some feces that had been uh, wrapped in the, the newspapers. The garbage also contains pages and pages of handwriting. It was unique pieces of equipment in line and line and line of them and crossed off. They seem to be like weaponry and tanks or ships or whatever. It's, it was almost like some kind of game or some kind of fantasy. When detectives show these lists to local law enforcement, they find out the peculiar writings have turned up at other crime scenes. We found that these same lists had been showing up at other break-and-enters in the area. 
An unknown man dubbed the House Hermit is wanted by local police for breaking into cottages and stealing items. They were fairly valuable things. So somebody who had an eye for antiques of some sort was going around taking things. Whoever he is, he's armed. We had a gentleman who had his house broken into and certain firearms were stolen, including an antique English Browning handgun. The house hermit also lives temporarily in some of the cottages. When he abandons them, he leaves behind the military lists and much more. He had uh, collected his urine in orange juice bottles and his feces in newspapers. Strange behavior, and it became even stranger. Local police tell detectives that the house hermit is suspected in a recent armed run-in with a couple at their cottage, the Appletons. Of particular interest to me is the information that, in fact, he has abducted people at gunpoint from one of these residences where the people are coming back to their cottage and they happen upon them and they're actually abducted and taken to Toronto, which we have had happen in the Blackburn case as well. However, in this abduction, Mr. Appleton drove to Toronto but refused to go to his home. Instead, he told the house hermit to get out of the car in the middle of Toronto's busiest intersection. He said that you're not going to defile my house and I'm not going to follow your instructions and the individual got very, very frustrated and ended up jumping out of the car down at Young and Dundas Street and leaving them. The house hermit got away, but police found a set of his fingerprints at the Appleton's cottage. Unfortunately, the prints don't match anyone on the national database. Whoever he is, he may also be responsible for killing the Blackburns, which occurred just weeks after the Appleton's abduction. And in my experience, and certainly with the agreement of many others in the investigation, is this is all linked, that the house hermit was the person that was responsible for Ian and Nancy Blackburn's death. And the Appleton's description of the house hermit matches Kate Line's profile of the Blackburn's killer. The age was close to the age of, uh, of what she had put in her profile. And uh, certainly his actions, I would describe, he was a very quiet, he was almost polite in his manner. It did fit into what she had written in the profile. It's enough for police to make finding the house hermit their top priority. Sergeant Lines recommends detectives release the lists of military equipment to the public. I just thought it was so unique. It stood a pretty good chance of if somebody saw it and recognized it, that maybe they would feel compelled to contact police. But it's a risky move that could backfire. Police and prosecutors are very leery to tip their hands as to the evidence that they have. You don't want people coming forward with false confessions or, you know, saying that they created those lists. Desperate to find the killer, investigators take Kate Line's advice. They release the writings to the public, hoping someone will identify the author. We have several writings from that person, and they relate to battleships, aircraft. It may even be a game he's playing on paper. We're not sure, but there is a a military buff of some type. When we released it, we had no idea what the results would be. And you never do. Like when you release information, it's like a, almost on a hope and a prayer. Investigators hope to be flooded with tips. They only get one call. But it's the one call that counts. It may even be a game he's playing on paper. We're not sure, but there is a, a military buff of some type. Are these bizarre writings the calling card of a killer? Handwritten war games were left behind at multiple break and enters and on the Blackburn's property, the site of Nancy Blackburn's murder, and from where her husband Ian was abducted and later killed. Police hope by releasing a sample to the public, they'll find the man responsible. Maybe somebody who reads, you know, the media or, you know, the other methods that it was released would see that and go, wow, I know somebody who did that kind of thing or played those kinds of games. On May 28th, the lists of war games make the headlines and catch the eye of Alison Walton. I saw the paper actually on the table and I noticed the headline which said, police hunt military buff. I started reading it and I thought, this sounds familiar. For some reason, I don't know why. When Allison reaches the list of military gear, her blood runs cold. I'm absolutely positive. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I know that handwriting. I know it's 
it's David Snow. I know it's him. Allison had met David Snow four years earlier when she and Darris, her husband at the time, moved out of Toronto. Their new home was Orangeville, just over an hour's drive to the northwest. Darris found work on the renovation of the town's old train station alongside another handyman, David Snow. He was working there, which is where I met him. He was a total loner. He had clear blue eyes and kind of shy. There's just something kind of strange about him, and I could never put my finger on it. David was the town eccentric. Even though he had a home in Orangeville, he had been known to disappear for weeks at a time with no explanation. I remember a lot of, oh, that's just David. Despite Allison's reservations, her husband, Darris, became friends and then business partners with the shy loner. They got buildings from the counties that were about to be abandoned and paid a dollar, got the buildings and sold whatever was inside and then they had to take them apart. That was the deal. When Allison had her first child, she saw a surprising side to David. Oh, he loved her. It was the only time I ever saw him, like, be a real human being. Loved her, totally. David even babysat for the couple, but he wasn't as committed to the business. He would rarely show up for work. Then in 1991, David disappeared from town altogether leaving Darris, his business partner, in the lurch. Allison and husband Darris started going through David's storage container, hoping to recoup some of their losses. To sell off whatever was in there. For Darris to get what he could from the buildings that he and David had worked on. But they find much more than building supplies. There's all this pornography, like hardcore pornography in there and it's all in files and the pieces are cut out. Pieces of women's bodies cut out and put in these files. Like it was that thick. There are more troubling discoveries. I found a book of all this military equipment. It looked like some kind of war weaponry. Yes, that's what I thought it was, weaponry. Pages and pages of military equipment. It's creepy, but not criminal. It's all tossed out in the trash. The couple think that's the last time they'll ever have to deal with David. Until Allison recognizes the military lists in the paper seven months later. I'm thinking, I don't know what to do. One of my sisters was there. I said to her, what should I do? Allison and her family are about to move across the country to Vancouver. Like, I'm ready to go to Vancouver to live my new life on Monday. This is Saturday. She said, phone the cops. So I did. I remember getting a phone call from one of the investigators involved in the case when David Snow had been identified. I was thrilled. And I also thought, you know what, the risk was worth was worth it. Sergeant Lines knows that David is likely the house hermit and also the man who murdered Ian and Nancy Blackburn in cold blood. It's just cemented at all that this is the same person, but a big difference was is we knew who it was. We had a name now. Police run David's name through their database. They discover he has a minor criminal record, just what Kate Lines had predicted. We found out that David Snow had been charged with uh, several uh, charges of false pretenses, which related into NSF checks. Months earlier, David had been charged with fraud in his hometown of Orangeville. He was released until his court date, which he didn't show up for. But the good news, he was fingerprinted. We were able to retrieve the original fingerprints that were taken uh, by the Orangeville Police Service from David Snow. Detectives compare them to a set of fingerprints pulled from the cottage owned by the Appletons, the elderly couple who survived being abducted at gunpoint by the house hermit. We then compared the Orangeville Police Service fingerprints with the unknown ones at the Appleton residence and confirmed indeed that David was responsible for the Appleton kidnapping. And quite likely for the murder of the Blackburns as well. Absolutely one of the most wanted people at that particular time. We have someone that we feel fairly confident is offending 
and is, has a sexual fantasy that involves women, an abduction, that type of thing is of grave concern. David is a dangerous fugitive on the run and likely armed with guns stolen from his B&Es. Police get a warrant to search David's Orangeville home. David's long gone, but what he's left behind is telling. In Orangeville, we saw pornography everywhere. He lived a fantasy life. But it's a black briefcase that reveals a possible link to the Blackburn murders. Upon opening, it contained dozens and dozens of photographs. In going through those photographs, we actually found a number of them that depicted the Blackburn's round barn, which is, from what I learned at the time, is very rare. There were only a couple in Ontario. The finding is significant. David Snow clearly knew of the Blackburn's property prior to the murders, a fact confirmed by David's former business partner, Darris, and his wife, Allison, once they are shown the photographs. David had asked him to take him to drive him over there because this couple had a farm in Caledon and they had a round barn, which was very unusual. And David was quite into barns. They had gone over and they had been invited in and treated really nicely. David was familiar with the property and the couple themselves, just as Kate Lines had predicted in her profile of the unknown offender. We knew who we wanted, but we didn't know where he was. In Ontario, there's a dangerous fugitive on the loose. Police have a warrant out for the arrest of David Snow, the prime suspect in the double homicide of Toronto couple Ian and Nancy Blackburn. We had probably one of the most massive manhunts in Ontario going on for close to five or six weeks, thinking he was still in the area. We knew who we wanted, but we didn't know where he was. Sergeant Kate Lines, the criminal profiler on the case, worries there will be more victims. Notices go right across the country when we have one of these high-risk cases and homicides and assaults that are of grave concern to any community that this person is going to be residing in or passing through. While police search for David Snow, across the country, a terrifying sequence of events is unfolding. Jim Hutchinson gets an urgent call from another detective. Have you been watching your TV? The Mounties in North Vancouver are looking for an individual who has uh, abducted some women out there, and I think it's your guy. Earlier that day, an RCMP officer had come across a deserted car along a remote road on Mount Seymour. When he investigated the surrounding woods, he was shocked to see a man who had two women tied to trees. Before the officer could get to him, the man escaped. And he took off and had the biggest manhunt in North Vancouver history. The two traumatized women told police they were kidnapped from their respective workplaces and then repeatedly assaulted. If the offender hadn't been interrupted, they might not have lived another day. It came quite clear that everybody was quite lucky that he didn't kill anybody in Vancouver. Those are horrendous crimes. The injuries on the surviving victims are significant to Sergeant Kate Lines. The same types of injuries, the same bindings and bondage that occurred with those victims seems to be the same as what had happened with Nancy. While the manhunt comes up empty, police collect evidence from the car owned by one of David's victims, who he forced to drive to the woods in North Vancouver. We did know the pieces of property that he left in the car at uh, Mount Seymour Park, that they were consistent with what was stolen at the break and enters in Ontario and the camera equipment that was missing from Ian Blackburn's place. More proof that the offender is likely David Snow. But if it is him, how did he get from Ontario to British Columbia? A ticket agent at the Toronto train station identifies a picture of David Snow. The man who called himself David Wilson made an impression on her when he bought a ticket around the time of the Blackburn murders. She identified this person as being aggressive, being arrogant. He was in there wanting to buy a ticket and wanting to buy it right that particular moment and get out of the city as fast as he could. He treated her basically like a piece of garbage is the way she told us. And, and then he, he walked away and he was uh, very disgruntled and he called her uh, a bitch as he left. There's a massive hunt on for David Snow. Not only is he the main suspect in the murder of Ian and Nancy Blackburn, 
He could also be responsible for the recent spree of abductions and assaults on women in Vancouver. What happened is the person who had committed some pretty serious crimes in Vancouver had run from the police and was currently being looked at in a manhunt in the uh, mountains of North Vancouver. Police have no idea where he is until 4 o'clock in the morning of July 12th. Two patrolmen respond to a call from an alarm company to check out a North Vancouver restaurant. When one officer walks around the back... They saw a guy who was reefing on something. He chased him from that location, tackled him and arrested him. It's David Snow. He had been assaulting a 53-year-old restaurant employee and then strangling her using the wire hanger from a potted plant. And he had also put a plastic bag over her head and she was very, very close to death. If the police officers and security company had not arrived within those two or three minutes, that lady would be dead today, I'm sure. David's two other assault victims in Vancouver had been treated just as brutally, stripped, tied up, and assaulted. It wasn't a strictly a sexual urge act. It was a very controlling, bondage type of environment. I could see how prevalent sexual fantasy was in, in the sexual assaults that were occurring against those victims in the West. Um, it was sexually sadistic, very painful for the victims there to endure. Finally, David Snow is caught. In a North Vancouver courtroom, Snow pleads guilty to 10 charges, including sexual assault and unlawful confinement. When police from Ontario come to interview him, they are struck by how closely the 37-year-old matches Kate Line's criminal profile. Well, it's remarkable how accurate Kate's profile was. She had nailed him in every aspect of the profile. Age range, um, the sexual deviancy, the fact that David Snow had not been involved in any major crimes other than NSF checks, you know, and that's exactly what Kate has told us. Out of 25 characteristics, David Snow matches 23 of them. The more important thing for me is that it helped in the investigation. Five years after the deaths of Ian and Nancy Blackburn, Snow is convicted in a Toronto courtroom of first-degree murder. I've had the occasion to actually be quite close to him and, and stare him right in the eye, and it's just a blank stare. It just doesn't seem to be anything there. Six months waiting for this to come, and so thrilled that we finally have a verdict we all want. Because he's designated a dangerous offender, Snow can be kept in prison for the rest of his life, a relief to the victim's families. Just the reading of the verdict, and then the overwhelming like emotion that, that came over everybody. I probably do hate him, but I try not to even think about him anymore because you waste your energy thinking about him. These were somebody's brother and somebody's sister and somebody's child, and hopefully as time goes on, whether it be criminal profiling or other techniques that we just get better and better at catching these people quicker, and then uh, putting them behind bars so they won't harm anyone else. Kate Lines was eventually promoted to Chief Superintendent of the Behavioral Science Section of the Ontario Provincial Police. For more information, go to ownca.opra.com slash murder, she solved.